Well, good morning from uh, minus 22 temperature outside. Going to be praying for our homeless folks. Going to break bread thinking about Acts chapter 7 and the death of Stephen, who died, I'm going to suggest, consciously modeling himself upon the death of the Lord Jesus, whom we're here to remember. Let's, let's start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you, and we come to your Son, dying for us on the cross and risen again, seeking, Father, to consciously model ourselves upon him. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will go with each of us in our thoughts, in our devotions, that we, Father, might truly fix our gaze upon him in his time of dying and in his resurrected glory now and that he might be the strongest abiding reality to us in our lives. Forgive us our sins, Father. Forgive us our loss of focus, and encourage us and spur us on to remain focused upon him and your love and your grace that is through him. We pray, Father, for all our brothers and sisters, for those at this moment who are cold, those who are hungry, those who are persecuted, those who at the other end of the spectrum are distracted by their materialism and their life of ease. We pray, Father, that for all of us, we might refocus and that you will work in our lives to focus us upon your son, upon him, who is really the love of our lives. Please help us, Father, and go with us for his sake. Well, here we are breaking bread, maybe in big churches, maybe in ones and twos. But the essence of our faith is our focus upon the Lord Jesus. The problem is that it can seem weird that I am sort of alone remembering Jesus. So why am I not part of something bigger? Why is it just, just him and me kind of thing? I know many folks faithfully break bread on their own as I've done many times, many parts of my life. And you do sort of pinch yourself and think, wait a minute, is, is this for real? Yeah, it is. There is a difference between religion and spirituality. You see this really with Stephen. Why here in Acts 7, okay, he's giving his answer to their accusations of, of the Jews. And at the end of it, they get so incensed with him that they lynch him, drag him out of the city, stone him to death. Okay, but how did all this start? Well, back in chapter 6, they say in verse 11, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Verse 13, they set up false witnesses that said, This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place, the temple, and the law. One minute. The charge was blasphemy against God. Evidence, you blasphemed the temple, this holy place. So you see, they have made God equal to the temple. And the Lord Jesus had been very clear in the Olivet Prophecy that the temple was to be ripped down stone by stone. You believe that, you preach that, you're speaking blasphemy against God. No, the temple is going to be destroyed, yeah. Oh, blaspheming God by saying that. But you see, they had turned the temple into God. The charge was, you blasphemed God. Evidence, you spoke blasphemy against this holy place. God equaled the temple in their mind. They had not ha had a personal relationship with God. It was all about religion, all about going to the church, if you like, to the temple. And to do away with that is to do away with God, as far as they were concerned. You remember Jeremiah, where there's a time when they are saying, oh, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. And God says, yeah, sure, but you don't love me. Well, lamentations of Jeremiah, the lamentations over the destruction of the temple. One thing that comes out of that book is that you, you can lament the loss of your religion, the decline and destruction of your temple, and actually have no relationship with God at all. This is the thing. And so, each of us, I believe, God has worked in our lives to bring us to a point where we are outside the temple, if you like, 
but in relationship with him. Now that could have arisen from an old load of things. It could be that you, there you were sailing along in your church life and oh, you went through a divorce and your ex is still in the church and well, you can't really go there. Could be that you're a, a Christian believer in a strongly non-Christian country and there is no church to go to. It could be that you come to figure God's not a trinity and you believe in the, in a non-Trinitarian position about Jesus and the churches around you say, well, you can get out of here. If that's what you believe, you're not Christian. What do you do? It could be a whole load of things. It could be you're the victim of a mud campaign in the church and you get slandered and muddied and you can't show your face in the church anymore. Or whatever it might be. It could be a whole range of things. But actually, I think that every true believer goes through this at some point in some way. It could be that you remain the life and soul of the party in the church, but in your heart, it's not that you don't believe. In your heart, you are separate from all that. In your heart, you have your own belief about God and the Lord Jesus that is somewhat out of step with the party going on around you, but you remain there for the sake of your family, for the sake of serving other people. But you and yourself are feeling rather lonely. Isolated. Well, this speaks exactly to us because I believe all of us have all the scaffolding of religion removed from us in some way or another in the course of our lives so that we come personally to Jesus, so that we take this bread and wine knowing that the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That's, I think, why all that scaffolding gets gets removed, as I say, maybe visibly or not visibly, but it happens. I've seen it in so many lives, in fact, in the lives of pretty well all the serious believers that I have known in the course of my life, obviously seen it in, in my own life. And so Stephen could have answered to save his own skin and said, no, no, no I, I think Moses is great, I think the temple is great. Yeah, sure, I, I, I think it's great. And to try to save his own skin. But he wanted their salvation. And so he gives a, an account of the history of Israel uh, that is actually, yes, not blaspheming, as they were saying, but certainly saying that the concept of holy space, that the temple is the holy place, that that is, no, not so. And he starts off with Abraham, and he says, The God of glory, verse 2, appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he even lived in Haran. In other words, he's saying that the God of glory appeared, and he is saying that there was a sort of cherubim, Ezekiel 1-style revelation to Abraham, which is not directly there in the Hebrew text in Genesis, although the Septuagint seems to imply that, but he's saying that that's what happened, that God's glory appeared, and where did it appear? Not in Israel, not in a temple, but a guy in Mesopotamia, in Ur of the Chaldees. God's glory is manifested to individuals, that's what he's saying, outside of the promised land, outside of the temple system, outside of holy space. And all through this account of Israel's history, he labours Israel's weakness and salvation by grace. And we'll start with Abraham. He says, right, well, God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, leave your land and your kindred, go into the land which I will show you. But what did he do? He left the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, God removed him into this land, wherein you now dwell. So, he starts off by saying, yeah, Abraham, our father, was not that obedient. He lived in Ur and was told in Ur of the Chaldees, separate from your land and from your family. He doesn't do that. He takes his father with him and his relative Lot and he leaves. Does he go to Canaan? No. He goes to Haran and he stays there for about 23 years, I think you can work out. And only when his father dies does he go to Canaan. But he, he himself says, God, remove me from my father's house. God took me here, he says. And here again, it, it says God removed him into this land. So it's God's grace 
I'm not saying Abraham was totally disobedient, but his obedience was limited. And God sort of saw the very limited move that he made. And, okay, I, I'll leave this Earl of the Chaldees and confirmed him every step of the way. But he would not go into the land of Canaan. He was kicking around 23 years in Haran. It was all by grace. And then he goes on to say, yeah, Solomon, who of course they like to see as the wonderful builder of the temple and so forth. He said, you know, God didn't want a temple. But he, he, he emphasizes that here. God said, I do not live in houses made with hands, but Solomon built him a house. Weakness. And he talks about how the, the brothers of Joseph, the founding fathers of the nation, were terrible, terrible bunch. And Joseph was made known to them at the second time. Looking forward, I guess, to the Lord's return and at the second time being made known to his brethren, not the first time. He talks about Moses. And he says that after Moses uh, had killed the Egyptian, he fled from fear. He fled, he says, from fear. Verse 29, and Moses fled at this saying and went into the land of Midian. In Hebrews 11, Paul says that Moses fled not fearing the wrath of the king. Well, here it says that he fled because he feared Pharaoh. So did he fear Pharaoh or did he not? Well, both. And isn't that yeah, can't you understand that? Isn't that, you know, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Is it not that spirituality is never absolute? You believe and yet help my unbelief. He fled. Why? Did he fear the wrath of the king? Yes. The Exodus record says so. This says so. Acts 7, yeah, Stephen says so. So he, he fled from fear. Hebrews 11, Paul says, no, he did not fear. He had faith. So, yeah, he had faith, but not complete. And you see, this is very much how it is all the time. That faith is not absolute. And Stephen is making this, this point all the way through. And why is he doing this? Because he wants them to accept God's grace as it is in the Lord Jesus. And this is why he's not trying to save his own skin. He wants, by all means, to try to persuade them that you will not get salvation through the temple system, through Judaism, through keeping the law of Moses. It is in Jesus Christ. And that is why at the end, he prays for them to be forgiven. Now, 1 Kings 8, Solomon had said, well, if you sin, you can pray towards the temple and get forgiven. No. He cries out loud so they can hear above the yelling that they were making and the thud of the stones, do not lay this sin to their charge. Forgiveness then is by grace, and it is through Jesus. Now, it might appear that the folks that he was talking to were just a waste of time, that these people were so bitter and so incensed that you can reason with people like that. What's the point? Well, he had this hope against hope. And of course, it came wonderfully true, didn't it? In that the man who was clearly coordinating this, Saul of Tarsus, was the one who was persuaded. Now, when you look at Paul's writings, you can see that he is alluding very often to odd phrases that come out of Act 7. Clearly, this speech of Stephen was written on Saul's heart, and when the Lord later said to him, Saul, it's difficult for you to walk against the cattle prods of conscience. Well, a lot of them, those cattle prods were coming out of Act 7. And so <clears throat> Stephen's desperate desire to save people worked out, and as I'm sure you've often thought, what a wonderful day in the day of resurrection when Stephen is resurrected and, well, there's, there's, there's Saul, one of the greatest Christians who did the most to get the Lord's name out there to the Gentiles, was that guy who was just shaking with hatred against me as I died. Absolutely incredible. And his hope, his prayer, please forgive them. Well, yeah, it was answered. But does God forgive people without repentance? Well, that's something we could debate. But... 
the point is that, yeah, forgive, uh, repentance is surely got to be a factor, but he prays, don't lay this sin to their charge, implying, I think, and may they repent. And Saul did. Maybe others amongst them did, but Saul certainly did in due course. And so you see that your work of witness, of preaching, etc., may bear fruit in a fantastic way, but after, after you're dead. I often see that. Here in this hall, I've baptised old people. Better be careful what I say about old people. Middle-aged elderly people who have stood in that bath, baptism bath, just there. And it said to me, oh, if only my mum were alive to see this. And I said, what do you mean? Oh, back in the Soviet years, my mum was an underground Christian, very committed. Her hope and desire was that I should be baptised and become a believer. And Well, I didn't. I went the way of the world. I was sucked up in, you know, Marxist-Leninism and, and the, the life of the world as it was in those days here in the Soviet Union. And, well, I didn't. But now I get it. Oh, and mum died thinking that I had just gone to the world, as I had done. But now I get it. So here you see how wonderful it's going to be in the kingdom, the restoration of relationships. Well, what happened here with, with Stephen, when they lynch him, it says they cried out, 57, with a loud voice and rushed upon him with one accord. And they dragged him out of the city and stoned him at least twice in Paul's life, according to the later record in Acts, that happened to Paul. They rushed upon Paul with one accord. They were so incensed against him, the Jews, and they dragged him out and nearly killed him. In fact, at Iconium, it seems that they did stone him to death and he kind of resurrected. Why the similarity? I think it's too primitive to say, yeah, well, what goes around comes around. That may be true in secular life. But I think here you have God's providential hand. That Saul, Paul, came to understand how Stephen had felt. He came to understand how Stephen had felt. And so I think that God works like that in our lives. That circumstances happen to you that other people went through, perhaps went through at your hands. So that, not so that you are punished, no, it's not in the sense of punishment. It is so that you understand them. Because you're going to live forever with them. And do not think that you've never hurt anyone or that your actions and positions and attitudes have not hurt others. They have, mine have, yours have. Do not be so arrogant as to think that you have not hurt people. You have. And God works in your life so that you come to understand how they felt. Because the, the next moment you're going to be in their kingdom with them. That's the thing. So, they get so incensed, they are cut to the heart, their heart is ripped in, in, in two by Stephen's reasoning. On one hand, they see it. And people who pretend they don't get the gospel, they do. The gospel by its nature touches human conscience. And they just lynch him. They, they just become crazy like animals. And they stone him to death. And he kneels down and prays as they're chucking their stones. And he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. When he'd said this, he fell asleep. Well, those three things are all exactly what Jesus did in the lead up to his death. He knelt and prayed in Gethsemane, just like Stephen. He says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Jesus said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The Lord said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here he says, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. So, he is consciously modelling himself and his time of dying upon the death of the Lord Jesus. And so, the cross of Jesus, the death of Jesus, which we now remember, is not like an icon 
that you look at from a distance and say, yeah, yeah, Jesus, a long time ago, a long way from where I live, died on the cross for me. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so I'm, yeah, I'm kind of good. Yeah, that is true. But the point is that he there is a pattern to be followed. This is the big problem with, let's say, Catholicism, Russian Orthodoxy, that that see the cross of Jesus as a physical thing, a physical icon that you touch or cross yourself in front of, or that you sort of see away from me. No, he there is our living pattern. Paul is very often on about this in his letters. Philippians 2 would be the clearest one. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on to talk about the mind of Jesus at his time of dying. So he's saying, let this mind be in you, which was in him there. His spirit there must be in you. He poured out his soul unto death, Isaiah 53, 12 says, and Philippians 2 quotes that about Jesus that he also poured himself out. Trinitarians are totally wrong to think that talks about what happened when Jesus was born, that like he was up in heaven and poured himself out down here. No, Isaiah 53 is not about that. Isaiah 53 is about the Lord's death. It was there that he humbled himself progressively unto death, even the death of the cross. And let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Peter also has the same thing in, in, in his letter, in his letters, exactly the same. That we are to suffer as he suffered. And so the sufferings of Christ, Paul says, abound in you. You die with him that you might live with him. His death and his resurrection and his life becomes ours. And so he there, whom we remember in the bread and wine, it is not simply a historical entity. This is not mere history. He there becomes a model to be consciously followed. And you see this in Stephen, absolutely. He copies Jesus. The very words that the Lord said just before he died, he repeats. And by the way, in facing death suddenly and violently, the natural response is to think about yourself. Now, I have twice faced violent death. And my immediate reaction in front of, you know, safety catch off the revolver pointed at me, this is it, my immediate reaction was, God, forgive me all my sins. God, please may I be in the kingdom. Forgive me all my sins. But I think that Stephen was more secure in Christ because his last words were not like that. When he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, I, I, maybe that is saying, Look, accept me, please. Accept my life. A bit like Nehemiah saying, you know, remember me for what I've done for good at the last day. Yeah, but his last words are, <laughs> forgive them. For, do not hold this sin to their charge. And with that, he dies. So you see there, you have a window, I think, into what it means to be secure in Christ. That as you face sudden and violent death, you are so secure in your absolute knowledge that I shall be saved that my sins have been dealt with. But what is left is to worry about others. I want you to be saved. And forgive them, lead them to repentance, forgive them. That's what Stephen wanted. And I think that's a profound insight into, into his mind. So, we are to consciously, as he did, model ourselves upon the Lord Jesus. And this is why... I keep saying, keep on reading the accounts of Jesus that you have in the Gospels daily. There's a big tendency to read books about Christianity, to maybe get very 
uh, obsessed with trying to understand what, I don't know, the beasts in Daniel mean, or Ezekiel chapter 38, or what exactly happened in Genesis 1 to 3. And all that has its place, and I'm not saying it has no place. Of course it has a place. But I'm saying that what it is to be a Christian is to be focused upon the Lord Jesus, to be Christ-centered, and to consciously try to copy him in his body language, in his words, in his thinking, in his attitude. That is what it is to be a Christian. And you see it in Stephen, absolutely, that he is totally giving himself to the Lord Jesus. He's trying consciously to model himself upon him upon Jesus. This is what it is to be a Christian. Well, he sees heaven opened, and he sees the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Standing. Thirteen times in the book of Hebrews, we read that the Lord Jesus sits at the right hand of the Majesty in heaven. Why is he standing here? Despite all that emphasis that the Lord is sitting, in fact, in Hebrews at one point, Paul makes the point that the, the priests of, of the uh, temple, they serve God standing, but Jesus serves God sitting down. It really emphasizes the point. But why then is Jesus standing? I think it shows that, sure, Jesus is seated, as it were, at the right hand of the majesty on high, but... He has passionate involvement in human life now. And, oh, there's Stephen. Oh, they're killing him. Uh, they're going to stone him to death. Stephen, keep, keep your faith. Go on, make it, make it. Go on, go on. And he's standing passionately involved. Do not think that having divine nature means that you have no emotion. This is the big mistake of the Greeks to say that a god must, by definition, have no emotion. That the gods were stone-faced, you know, incapable of pathos, of uh, you know, emotion, of pathos. Um, no. This is where the one true God and his son, the Lord Jesus, who has his nature as do the angels, and as we shall share, no, he has passion, he has emotion. And okay, the Lord Jesus, like his Father, is not limited by time as we are, in the sort of linear sense. Oh, whoops, what's happening? Oh no, that's happened. Yeah, okay, he, he has, the let's say, a wider perspective on, on time and on the, 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 the process of, of the human path kind of thing. But, all the same, he is so involved with us and feels for us that he can stand in passion. There's another take, though, on the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, and it is that it pretty much a quote from Daniel 7, where the Son of Man comes in the clouds of heaven. The idea of him standing could imply that, well, he was sitting, but now he's standing, about to return. And Luke's record of the uh, Olivet Prophecy, he talks about the Son of Man coming in glory, in heavenly glory. Well, this picture then, the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God, that is about to return. We know from earlier on in Acts that the Lord Jesus is going to be seated at the right hand of God until he returns idea here would be, well, he's been seated at the right hand of God, but now he's standing up and he is about to return. So this is very much a picture of the Lord Jesus about to return. Well, Jesus didn't, of course, return in Stephen's death. But, of course, for Stephen, the next waking moment will be the return of Jesus. Now, that is a wonderful thought. As you get older and you come closer to the inevitable, to, to your own death, 
let's get it right. Death is unconsciousness. There is no immortal soul. You're not conscious after you die. But death is a sleep. It says this. He fell asleep. And just as you don't know how long you've been asleep, you go to sleep and you wake up. So it will be for us. And truly, as Paul says in Romans, now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. Wonderful words. Now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. You know, that moment when we meet Jesus is now not very far off. It's quite apart from all the indications in the world that the Lord Jesus is going to come soon, be that as it may, you, this life is very short. It is really short. It is gone in a moment. And the next moment, we shall see Jesus. We are very close to seeing him, to his return. We are really close, very close from that point of view. It doesn't matter. Jesus doesn't come back for another million years. The main difference. We are very close, in that sense, to his return. And how do you live? We've got to live appropriate to that. That very soon I will meet him, because this life, however much longer I've got to cough and hack my way through this world, it's a very short time. And then we will see Jesus. And this is, I think, one dimension of this, that, that Stephen sees that Jesus about to return, no longer seated, but standing, the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven, just about to come. He sees the glory of God, just as Jesus is going to come in his Father's glory with the clouds of heaven, he is going to come. So then, <clears throat> here then is our challenge. To see the death of the Lord Jesus as something that I shall consciously imitate. That he is my pattern for me to follow. Oh, give me grace to follow my master and my friend. Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for the Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this bread in which we see the communion of the body of Christ. And we remember his promise that he will again eat and drink with us in his, our Father's kingdom. We pray that you will hasten the day, but especially that you will help us to realise that that day for each of us is very near. We thank you, Father, for Stephen's example, and we pray that we might follow it, and that we might, this week, consciously model ourselves upon Jesus, and that he might insistently and consistently and persistently be the pattern for all our thinking, our attitudes, our behaviour, our lives. We ask this for the sake of Jesus, for the sake of all that we have ever seen and known in him. Amen. Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for this wine in which we see the symbol of the blood of your Son. Father, we consider this to be the greatest honour that any man or woman could have to take this, to be connected with him, with his death and with his life. And we pray that truly he will be our pattern, our hero, the one we fain would follow absolutely to the end and rise again with him to live forever with him, to share his eternal glory. That, Father, is all our hope and desire. And we pray that you will deepen it and help us not to be distracted from it. Again, for his sake, because of all that we have seen and known in him.